India won its independence from the British Empire. And it started by one man, you know, um, Mohandas Gandhi, wandering around with this crazy idea that he was going to um, be non-cooperative with the occupation, and, um, but he wasn't going to hurt anybody in the meantime. He was going to bypass the entire situation, and he entrained the entire population over the years to basically peacefully resist the occupation. And if, if someone had looked at the beginning of that movement and said, what are the odds of this succeeding? All the pundits would say, zero percent possibility of succeeding. And that is, that is the prognosis given to us here today. And they're wrong, too. <laughs> Well, first I want to acknowledge my elders in this movement who are uh, obviously very, who are obviously very refined in their perception of the problem. I uh, sort of lived the problem uh, of getting new energy into the world uh, firsthand for nine years at the side of Bruce De Palma, who in part uh, was his own worst enemy, as many uh, pi pioneers are. Um, but uh, even leaving the United States, uh, he found vested interests, and um, I think vested interests and the collusion of public and, and private interest uh, is really one of the key obstacles uh, right now, but you have to ask, why are these people so afraid of change? And I think that's a, a psycho-spiritual problem at uh, the crux of it. And uh, so we have to be sure that we have overcome that completely within ourselves, uh, that we don't fear change. Uh, and um, I, I have some solutions that I have nurtured in my uh, visionary heart, and that is um, that we need a Hippocratic Oath for science as a whole, not just medicine. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's a, a realm of activism that should be pursued, that uh, you know, people involved with uh, the universities uh, can introduce to you know, more or less expand the movement within the, the heart of the beast, because uh, if you don't have people who will, you know, take money to do things detrimental to the environment because they have a, a more fundamental moral conviction, um, you can't exactly have a, uh, um, you know, uh, problem like we have right now. Although the problem is so great that I, I've discovered even if we were to make incremental gains in the renewable energy sector of 300% uh, uh, increases in, in renewable energy, clean energy technology between now and 2020, we would only reduce oil dependence by 2%. So we absolutely need a revolution if we're not going to completely uh, erode the environment uh, to the point that we might have a scenario like we saw in the film uh, The Day After Tomorrow. So um, just to, to refocus on the question of the psycho-spiritual dilemma, uh, I think the courage to change begins within each and every one of us, and that's what precipitates the common movement that we seek is, is harmonizing ourselves to what I would, I guess, call a, a, a unanimous sentiment that this has to happen and that we are its agents. And um, when I think about the implications of this, this whole drama, it um, completely takes me to my limits. It, um, 
that makes me confront everything up to and including the fear of death. And um, I think that's what is at the root of conservatism, actually, which is one of the things that prevents change, is that if you threaten the status quo and you suggest fundamental change, um, people would rather close their door and, and stick with what's comfortable because they would have to, and particularly their ego, would have to confront the, uh, the thought of losing everything. And um, who wants that? So um, courage really is, is the key. And I loved um, Stephen Greer's invocation of the, the concept of spirit warriors. That really that sums it up for me. And um, it's not a war that should uh, have to involve conflict. We can just bypass the existing system if we have enough harmonious momentum amongst ourselves. Okay, great. We have just a few minutes for people in the audience to go to the mics and offer their own viewpoint on these questions and try to be as brief as possible so as many people in line can have a chance. Yes, I heard Brian O'Leary uh, lament the number of scientists who have a knee-jerk opposition to to these new energy technologies. I heard Gene talk about the journalists that are not prepared to go where they should be going with their journalism. I heard Peter talk about the, the shortcomings of our leadership. And I wonder if any of you would like to talk about the, the institutional mechanism whereby someone spends decades rising up the ladder of success in their given career and is systematically groomed and conditioned to believe a certain ideology that does not comport with objective reality. I think you stated it really well. <laughs> You know, the, the way I see it is that we're involved in a conundrum, uh, a confluence of conundrums and objections, uh, which are culturally conditioned and are so far removed from reality that we're now needing to address it and become educated on, on this. So, for example, I was very inspired with what Andrew just said. Uh, <clears throat> part of that is the social dynamic that better the devil we know than the devil we don't know. And we're now confronted with a situation where, where the resistance comes from virtually every culturally conditioned group. So we need to have the courage to emerge and to make the whole thing a whole new movement. And that's why we're here. And courage is the key. And as a spiritual warrior, I understand that we are all here as one human being because biologically we are the closest species that exists on this planet and as the Dalai Lama once said in the 80s he said we are all same human so as we become human no matter how many decades of service we have in our profession or our ego we are at a critical point on the planet where we must surrender and understand that as uh, Dr. Greer so beautifully put it, we have to admit all that we don't know so that we can become children of this planet again and then allow Gaia to guide us forward into our future evolution. So thank you to you, Steve, and to Joel, and to everyone here locally who uh, enabled this conference because it takes a lot of work. But it's a very dynamic moment, and out of the chaos and the negativity in which we are living will come the phoenix of the new time. So, oh. thank you. Uh, my name is David Wright uh, from Sustainable Ballad in Seattle. Um, before I say anything, I wanted to congratulate all of you in the crowd uh, and you as panelists for having the courage to stand up here, sit up here and talk amongst each other about the problem of peak oil when oil will run out cheap oil, that is, um, and talk about it in terms of social networking, coming together, creating new community, and the revolution is very correct. Um, 
This is, this is remarkable, just remarkable. Um, two questions. One is, um, how do you advocate the spreading of this kind of technology uh, to people and at the community level? Uh, in such a way that it cannot be used as an excuse to continue the, uh, the rapacious consumption that we already have now because of oil. First question. Second question is, how do we, and related to that, how do we return the power to the people to be able to actually make some of these devices ourselves? Because it's my belief that these technologies should be user and end user friendly. In other words, people should be able to make them themselves. If they are photo, photo cells, they should be able to make them from raw materials. Same thing with other Unity, over Unity devices. Otherwise, we're not going to have a true democracy at that level. I, I can repeat the question. The question he was asking was, how can we do it, first of all, at a community level to not uh, consume fossil fuels as much as we are? And, and there's a, a renewable option that actually is available on a federal level, uh, even for states to adopt. And many states are adopting uh, percentages of their total energy budget within that state to be mandatorily generated from renewable energy. Um, I, I know there's some states that have 10%, for example, and that's the, the renewable RPS that's very uh, common. So if you demand that in Oregon, I don't believe you have a renewable um, portfolio that demands 10% from renewable energy on a statewide generation level. But that's definitely one to advocate. Um, and then, from state government. Here's the mic. Uh, yeah, go, go back to the mic. Take your okay. position. <laughs> uh, and the second part I can address too, unless somebody else wants to. Um, I, I just wanted to, I was just checking to see whether anyone was here from the state energy office. And I believe we will have in the audience tomorrow uh, the advisor to the governor on energy and sustainability. I've been in conversation with him. Next. No, there was a second question. There was a second question, but. Uh, how, how to communicate to. Uh, come, come. No, it was how, really how about make, building. How to make the technology oh, yes, so it has right to do back. with will we, are we likely to see, or is there some way to encourage the likelihood of having devices that actually can be built right. by people at the grassroots. People have been demanding that for decades, and I don't believe that's a necessity to finally seeing something work. Uh, what is a necessity is to get the investors to at least open up to the possibility of inventors having unusual projects in their local basements or garages. And that's what we're discovering as you start looking. You see the, the gold and, and the amazing uh, inventions in the midst of all the other uh, sand that you got to sift through to find it. Um, the Apollo Alliance is another good one, too. I might have mentioned that before, apolloalliance.org because they're supporting on a national level the aspect exactly the same point, that there are breakthroughs that just need a little bit of funding, and that's what we're finding too. Isn't there an open source movement too in the field where people are being called upon to collaborate and work together on the development of devices? Yeah, uh, Sue Carter's group, the Pure Energy Systems, has an open source thing on the that's internet. That's true. Yeah, they're a great group. Right. Well, we've website. seen what's happened in the computer field when that's let loose. Um, we, uh, we have a major competitor to Microsoft, thanks to the Linux open system. Exactly. I'm actually having some trouble uh, relying on the uh, tried and true approach of the investors uh, making this movement viable. I really think it has to, to be claimed as the right and responsibility of the grassroots. Um, and if we are ostensibly living in a democracy, then I think we have to use the tools of democracy at some level to compel uh, the government to revoke the oil depletion allowance that is being given in spades to the oil industry, which at times allows them to write off 
100% of their income tax annually uh, and uh, in favor of, of reallocating that subsidy to the development of alternative energy. Um, this could be put on a ballot initiative. Um, that's just one thought I've had. I think it's, it could be potentially transformative. Uh, and, and beyond that, um, you know, democracy, a representative democracy in itself is not supposed to be about somebody else doing it for you or calling up somebody and convincing them to do it, but actually you being the instrument of self-government that brings about the changes you want to see. And um, so at some level we have to focus on, like in your local municipality, um, convince, convincing yourself and your neighbors to um, convert your vehicles to biodiesel and uh, call it a fleet of cars and start trading in green credits and make your local economy uh, centered around alternative energy. And then you might have some money to support the guy in your community who's actually uh, pushing the envelope with, with truly unconventional energy technology. So um, I'm just not entirely convinced that there'll be tens of millions of dollars flowing from um, anywhere to make this happen uh, un until we have established ourselves in some way as a power to be reckoned with. Well, I... Um, uh, okay, I, next over here, Ken. Yes, and following up on that of uh, establishing our credibility, Tom, please explain to us as succinctly as you can what the experimental evidence is for over-unity performance in homopolar motors and generators. Well, you're asking about homopolar generators, and uh, of course yes. that's uh, an expertise of uh, one of our other panelists here. But in general, that's a rudimentary um, um, uh, attempt to reproduce what Faraday did in 1831 and what the Earth has been doing for who knows how many millennia. Uh, that is rotating a cylindrical magnet along its axis and producing electricity. Yeah, and probably Tawari's um, uh, documentation. He's probably taken the experiments the farthest. Tawari.org is where you would find yeah, that. I have looked at that and it's inconclusive. I want a little more specific description of it. Yeah, and, and, and my personal opinion is, is to promote the Ro Roshan and Godin experiments because you get a second level of nonlinearity there where you have many homopolars working in unity in a rolling fashion, which has just now been awarded a patent, uh, I'm happy to say, by the U.S. Patent Office. So I believe that we're going to see the development of how that should uh, evolve, um, perhaps even as NASA now yes, is using the tether. it has to be more than talk, and that's of pretty course. much okay, all that's been. NASA's uh, already sending tethers out there to... Uh, I need to, I need to exercise the prerogative of the chair here to move on to other topics and other questioners. If, uh, if you have a specific question about technology to take up with Tom or other people, uh, please do so. Uh, and I'd love to make a very brief physics comment on the homopolar generator, if I may. Brief. Very, don't? <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, I think we need yeah, to go on. Uh, I was, go ahead. I, I have a comment about uh, the enemy or us. Uh, we've seen 108 years that I'm aware of since you know, John Keeley demonstrated his device in front of 700 people in Philadelphia with the sympathetic, sympathetic vibratory physics dynosphere. And, and we've seen, you know, the sky's raining with technologies. I've been involved in a technology for 15 years. It's the public indifference that's really the inertia and the key to the change here. It's, it's the education. You can't, you can't just use the technology and even the capital. The capital is here. It's, it's how to get the capital behind it. So when you talk about revoking, the first thing that needs to be revoked is is our implied consent to the status quo. And if we revoke the implied consent, all of this changes. Absolutely true. Okay. Go ahead. Greetings, um, uh, panel. By the way, uh, it might be a good idea to say your name before you launch into your comments. Okay. My name is Christopher Gray. I'm from Oakland, California. Uh, in Oakland, or in the Bay Area, I represent a group, uh, Post Carbon 
uh, uh, Institute, and we're working on local sustainability models and issues. I had to take up two questions, because I've got these two conundrums that keep going in my mind, and I don't get a chance to <laughs> talk to people of this caliber every day. The first one is a sort of chicken and the egg thing that I, keep, I can't quite get my mind around, is this. Will new energy technologies have the effect of raising the consciousness, or do we have to raise our consciousness first before we qualify <laughs> to deserve to have access to this? Uh, Brian. I, I don't think we have time for that. It has to be a concomitant process. Right. Yeah, I agree. And therefore, uh, what we seek is support for the necessary research and development that needs to happen immediately. And that's, that's my plea, anyway. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll make some copies tomorrow of our mission statement, put them out on the table, and you'll get an idea of what we plan to do in the new energy movement, which is basically to ramp up to a research and development capability to the tune of 10 to $100 million. Uh, we, we, I've discussed this in detail with Steve Greer, Gene Malov, and a number of other people. If we can get that research and development done, then we have lots of options and we can concomitantly work on the principles of positive thinking, evolutionary planning, and so forth. And, you and that's why we invite the public to participate in this process, because I, I think it's going to happen. And, and, and that, then oh. once that happens, once we take that step of research and development, then it's, it's going to happen. And that leads me to my second, oh, go could, ahead. Could I, could I yes. address your, your first question, especially about, um, you know, do we have to raise our consciousness to deserve this? Absolutely not. We already deserve it, okay? Um, and the divine forces have been trying to put it on the planet for over 100 years. So there's, we already deserve it, okay? Um, what we, we, we need to raise our consciousness because we're polluting the planet to death, irrespective of whether this technology comes forward. And we have already been given the the tools to destroy ourselves. We could easily destroy ourselves again with this technology if we don't raise our consciousness. So, um, you see, we don't have to have this technology to destroy ourselves, um, but the aspect of destroying ourselves can't liberate us. So, like Brian said, both of these things have to happen simultaneously, but the appearance of this technology will not in and of itself raise our consciousness. And then that leads me, I come to some of the same conclusions, and unfortunately, the evidence that I see in this thing that I'm going to call reality, not being a pessimist, not being an optimist, but calling myself a realist and looking for evidentiary facts, I just don't see it. I mean, the number well, of people in this what room... What don't you see? Well, I'm, what don't you don't see, see the humans Bush changing. stickers, McDonald's, SUVs, tends to be the predominant model and you, paradigm out there. You are the source of the change. Absolutely, but I'm saying is that what my question was is realistically or honestly with six and a half billion counting people on the planet in this FUBAR system that we're in, do you, what's the feeling of the panel? Do we honestly, do you, what, do you, what do you give the I time? Hear, I hear dislocated? a strain of pessimism. Just a bit, just we, a little bit. We have no choice. The only choice we have is to move into it. Yeah. and make it a public issue and discuss and debate it. We have no other choice. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And, and, we're, and, we're, and we, can't wait, we, we can't wait for a panel of experts to solve it for us, and we can't oh, wait for, for you know, somebody else to do it before we do it. Okay? Every one of us has the responsibility to move forward, take responsibility, quit bickering, and get going. And, and there's no question that it's an overwhelming task. It's no, there's no question that it's an overwhelming task, and my, my mentor, Bruce De Palma, used to say, there's a myth of free energy, and that is that it is such a fundamental shift in the paradigm of the planet, from, ex, from consumption to expansion of the abundance of life, that the same souls incarnate at that time that it needs to happen. So, you know, take that for what it's worth, but we're here and we're trying, we're doing it, so. It. It's all we can do. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you. Just a general question for the panel. I'm Scott Anderson from the Beaverton, Oregon area. 
Um, why was Portland chosen? Was there some mitigating reasons why Portland uh, was chosen as a location to, to begin this uh, venture? Uh, besides, uh, as Mayor Vera Katz indicated in her welcoming letter, uh, Portland is a center of sustainability and uh, action to support that. Uh, but on a, a more mundane, practical level, uh, the two people that were available from the board for leadership on this, Joel Garvin and myself, just happened to live here in Portland. And we also were blessed by a tremendously gifted and dedicated crew that helped us out. A amen to that. Yay. We, we, we had a board meeting about, I guess, nine months ago, and it was proposed, and boy, we unanimously supported the idea because Portland's a wonderful place to bring this forward and because of Steve and Joel and their tireless efforts. We also arranged to have the weather be just right for you this weekend. <laughs> Well, um, or my name's Kathy Ging, and I, I worked as a renewable energy educator for 10 years. Um, Oregon State motto is she flies on wings of her own making. And I used that motto when I was director of the Oregon State Fair Oregon Energy Roundup in 82 through 84. And I would like to suggest that we start in Oregon to do a renewable energy, free energy exhibit again. And um, I also initiated Oregon's new revised tax credit that just was uh, taking the sunset provision out of it. It's a permanent part of the Oregon law, which was known as the best solar tax credit in the country when it went into existence in 1989. So I'd like to suggest that we do that. That was in contradistinction to the old blue sky approach to solar that was based on the amount of money spent on the energy system. This was based on the amount of kilowatt hours saved in the first year. And finally, I suggest that you look at the GAO report from the early 80s that looked at the federal small-scale appropriate technology grants program. They found that it was the most effective, cost-effective program the government had ever done in energy, and then they terminated the program. For instance, in Oregon, we had $200,000 money to give out. There was $10 million worth of applications. And finally, um, I started something in Southern Oregon called the Skills Bank with the intent of setting up a renewable energy national database, and I never really continued that. So I would like to give that uh, glove to you, and we could do a conservation and renewable energy and free energy skills bank nationwide starting right here. Thank you. I want to thank Kathy, and Kathy, would you put that in writing and give it to us? Yeah. Come find us later. Talk about a tough act to follow. My name is Brian Pace. Um, I'm a volunteer with the New Energy Movement. And uh, actually, with respect uh, to the rest of the panel, I had a question for uh, Gene Manning and uh, Tom Vallone, uh, respectively. Same question, though. Um, I think it might help me. Um, Gene, you have been a reporter um, and have talked about things as a layman, as a non-expert. Um, for a long time, and I guess I was wondering, you know, th there wasn't many editors in your time that said, go look at this, did they? Uh, Only Christine Jackson, whose magazine started out as the uh, English version of the German Raumannsite, and now is uh, Explore New Dimensions, and she gave me her air miles in turn for articles, and bless her. Okay, well, I mean, I guess the, uh, the, the follow-up to that question that, I, that applies to both of you is, is uh, you know, how is it that you decided to continue